Well, good evening. If you would, please turn me in your Bibles to Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah chapter 3, and we'll be beginning in verse 9. And last week, we saw God's pronouncement of judgment, both on the enemies of Judah and on Judah itself. This week, we're going to see God's salvation for the peoples, for the enemies of Israel, and the salvation of Israel. This should make sense to us. God's judgment and God's salvation are linked together. God's judgment is his enemy's greatest dread. And his salvation is his friend's greatest delight. The gospel of God is either the greatest or the worst news in the world, depending entirely on your relationship with God. Before we read. <coughs> oh, gracious God, our hearts praise you for the wonder of your love in Jesus. He is heaven's darling, but for us he is the incarnate, despised, rejected, crucified sin-bearer. But in him your grace is almost outgraced itself. In him your love to rebels has reached its height. Lord, we long to love you with a love like this. Our heart is stone, melted with your love. Our heart is locked. Let your love be the key to open it. Father, we adore you for your great love and the gift of Jesus Christ. Jesus, we bless you for giving up your life for us. Holy Spirit, we thank you for revealing to us this mystery. Great God, let your Son see in us the burden of his soul. Bring us away from our false trust to rest in him and him only. Let us not be hard and to his merit, so as not to love him. Let us not be indifferent to his blood, so as to not desire cleansing. Lord Jesus, Master, Redeemer, Savior, come and take possession of us. We are your right by purchase. In the arms of love, enfold and subdue the rebellious spirits. Take and use the totality of our being. We are not ashamed of our hope. We've trusted in you regarding our countless sins. You have cast them behind your back. We trust in you when evils surround us and you bring us into a pleasant place. We trust you in an hour of distress and you do not fail us, though our faith trembles. Oh, God. You have called us. You have ransomed us made us yours. And we adore your glory, honor, majesty, power, and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's read Zephaniah chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples to a pure speech, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, the daughter of my dispersed one, shall bring my offering. On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exalted ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. But I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord, those who are left in Israel. They shall do no injustice and speak no lies nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion. Let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. I will gather those of you who mourn for the festival, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors, and I will save the lame and gather the outcasts, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. And at that time I will bring you in, at the time when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says 
the Lord. We've, we've moved on from judgment of the Lord to God saving the people. So first, we see the time that God is going to do this great work. He begins, verse 9, For at that time I will change the speech of the people. What, what time is that time? It, it's the time referenced in verse 8, where, where God says, Wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up to seize the prey. For my decision is to gather nations, to assemble kingdoms, to pour out upon them my indignation, all my burning anger. For in the fire of my jealousy all the earth shall be consumed. For at that time I will change the speech of the peoples. It's the same day of the judgment of the Lord. It's the time that God will begin his work of redemption. This time is actually more than a, a single day. It's a time. It's a time that was inaugurated when Christ came to earth. When God became flesh. When, when, when Jesus came, when God came in, in flesh, he was bringing judgment and salvation to the world. It, it, was, it was inaugurated at the cross. It continues throughout the church age. And it culminates with Christ's second coming, with the, the final destruction of his enemies and their consignment to the lake of fire. God's judgment and God's salvation are both centered on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Whether you suffer his judgment or enjoy his salvation is, is entirely dependent on your standing with Jesus Christ. The world is judged for rejecting Jesus and saints are saved for accepting Jesus and that's what makes all the difference in the world whether the day of the Lord is, is the day of salvation or the day of wrath how do you stand with Jesus Christ we've seen the judgment last week we'll see it again before we come to the minor prophets but now Zephaniah is talking about the salvation of the Lord how will he save those whom he saves? He does it first by changing the speech of the peoples to a pure speech. It says he does this, that all of them may call upon the name of the Lord and serve him with one accord. We, we might remember when we're thinking of pure speech, we might think back to Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 6, when Isaiah sees the Lord, and what does he cry out? He says, Lord, I am undone. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Why, why is there a concern for pure speech? Why, why does it really matter that we have a pure speech? It, it matters because Matthew 12, 34, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Your, our, our tongue, our lips, our mouth is a parameter of the heart. It indicates what's happening in your heart. That to have pure lips, you must have a pure heart. Is your speech pure? Does your speech praise God, or does it curse Him? Do you build your brothers up, or do you tear them down? Do you confess Christ, or do you deny Him? Do you tell the truth? Do you breathe out lies? Is your speech pure? Is your heart pure? Most importantly, do you call on the Lord in prayer? Do you serve Him with your lips? Who owns your mouth? God, God is the one who's given us lips. He's given us minds to think in words. He's given us language to express our thoughts. All of it was created by the Lord. It was created for us to know Him, to relate to Him, to serve Him. And we've used it for so many other things. Use it wrongly. We blaspheme God with our lips. To be in the presence of the Lord, we must have pure speech, which God gives us by changing our hearts. And then in verse 10 he says, From beyond the rivers of Cush, my worshippers, the daughter of my dispersed ones, shall bring my offering. Um, Cush is the ancient name for Ethiopia which is just south of 
Egypt and or Israel, the Nile is pretty much the end of the world. I mean, they, they knew there was something on the other side of the Nile, but they never went there. They didn't know who lived there. It was just this vast wilderness in Africa. Even from, from beyond the river of Cush, from, from the ends of the world, God is going to gather his worshipers from places that, that the Israelites knew nothing about. They didn't know who lived there. They, they didn't know how to get there. They didn't know anything about it, but God has worshipers, even in this place, from people from every tribe and tongue and language and nation. They will all come, and they bring God's offering. What What is this offering? Because the sacrificial system is, is done away with. You, you might notice we never slaughtered an ox here. Not even a sheep or a goat or a dove. Because we're not supposed to. Christ is, is the single final sacrifice for sin according to Hebrews 10, 12. There's no more animal sacrifices. There's no more sacrifices for sin or for guilt. So, so what offerings are being brought? Hebrews helps us answer that question as well. Um, Hebrews really is basically a commentary on the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's wonderful. You should all read it. Um, Hebrews 13, 15 says that through Christ, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. Hebrews 13, verses 15 and 16. God doesn't want animal sacrifices. He doesn't want us to, to burn our first fruits to him wants us to praise his name with pure speech. He wants us to do good to one another and all people. He wants us to share what we have. God wants our, our praise, our acknowledgement, our obedience and good works. He has a right to the entirety of our lives. And that's what he asks us for. Are we bringing God his offer, what he desires? Of us. And then verse 11 it says, On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. And the fact of the matter is, the people have never been ashamed of the deeds with which they've rebelled against him. But formerly it was because they were hard-hearted, they were proud, they were blind, they didn't care about the Lord. They gloried in their shame because they considered themselves to be greater than the Lord. More important, you, you don't feel shame for rebelling against one that you don't think is, is worthy of your obedience. But when God changes their speech, when he changes their hearts, they become aware of the sinfulness of their deeds. They should feel shame. The deeds they committed, the deeds we committed are shameful. I mean just just think of, of anything in this world that, that you see or hear of or read about and you just think now that's that's just wrong. You don't even have to think about why it's wrong. You, you just hear it. Think things that aren't even polite to talk about in really any kind of company. It's just other it's wrong. All sin is that wrong. There, there's nothing more wrong than our rebellious deeds against God. No one has, has a greater claim on our obedience than God does. Nothing is worse than rebelling against God. And, and we've all done it. We should be ashamed of it, but God removes that shame from us. Because, the end of verse 11, I will remove from your midst your proudly exultant ones, and you should no longer be haughty in my holy mountain. God removes the shame by removing our pride. 
God, verse 12, I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. We, we are made humble. God removes our pride. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. God hates pride. And why does God hate pride? Because pride reveals a complete ignorance or indifference to who we are and who God is. To be proud is to elevate ourselves above the Creator, to deny God the glory and the honor that's His by right, to claim as our own what we only have by the grace of God. And 1 Corinthians 4, 7 says, What do you have that you have not received? And if you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Christianity, particularly biblical, reformed Christianity, produces, should produce, the, the humblest people in the world. Our, our salvation is entirely the work of God. We're just the recipients of His grace. Everything that you have, every gift you possess, everything you've accomplished, it's all the work of God and the gift of God. There's, there's no space for proud Christians. God removes the proud and exalted. He leaves a people humble and lowly. And there's, there's no, more, no more shame not because we, we forget our rebellious deeds, not because they're, they're not wrong, but because we're, we're humble to the point of, of knowing who we are. Recognize that we are rebellious, hell-deserving sinners, but God loves us and has taken away our sin from us and our guilt. We, we feel shame when we think, well, I'm better than that. Um, you know, if Danny and I were playing soccer against each other, I would not feel any shame at losing Danny. He's, he's a soccer player, play football. Um, if I beat Danny somehow, I would expect him to feel a great deal of shame for losing me in soccer. Because it's not what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to win. Um, we, we feel shame. We should feel shame. Because we should be better than we are. But God makes us humble. It's when we accept our, our brokenness, our smallness, our sinfulness, that the shame can be removed because we forget about ourselves. It's not about us. It's about God. It's about what He has done for us. It, it's, it's entirely about C.S. Lewis wrote that humility isn't self-belittlement. It's not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. It's self-forgetfulness. Forget about yourself. Turn your eyes to God. He is greater than you are. Let, let Him deal your sin, your shame, your failures. Forget about them and focus on God's goodness and glory and beauty. As they shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. That's um, one of my favorite songs. We've only sung it once. Sing it again. Eventually, uh, Jesus, lover of my soul, let me to thy bosom fly while the nearer waters roll, while the tempest still is high. Hide me, O oh my Savior, hide till the storm of life is past. Safe into thy haven, hide, O oh, receive my soul at last. Other <coughs> refuge have I none. Hangs my helpless soul on thee. Lead, O oh, leave me not. Leave, O oh, leave me not while I'm still. Protect and comfort me. We, we hide in the 
name of the Lord. We take refuge in the name of the Lord. Remember Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3. When, when Zephaniah is warning against the judgment of the Lord, he says, Seek humility, seek the Lord's righteousness, and perhaps you may be hidden in the day of trouble. This is where we hide. This is our refuge. It's the name of the Lord. It, it's not It's not us. It's not anything that we have in and of ourselves. We, we can't say, you know, here comes the judgment of the Lord. We can't say, no, I'm, I'm okay. I did these, these things, and I'm good now. I can, I can survive the judgment. We can't stand before the judgment. We can hide from it in the person of Christ. In the work of Christ. Take refuge in the name of the Lord. Then in verse 13, Zephaniah pivots to Israel very smoothly. Smoothly enough that it's actually very difficult to tell verses 11 and 12 whether he's still talking about the peoples, the Gentiles, the non Jews, or if he's talking about Israel there. But really, it's kind of appropriate that we're not sure who he's talking about there because they're, they're united people. Um, there used to be just an, un, an unbreakable separation between Jews and Gentiles. The Jews were God's people, and the rest of the world were not God's people. But <clears throat> God makes one new man out of the two. There, there's no longer separation between Jew and Gentile. Um, Romans 9 Verses 7 and 8 and in Romans 4, 11 make it clear that Abraham's offspring are not those who are merely descended physically from Israel, those who share the faith of their father, Abraham. Those who believe in the promises of God are the people of God. It's, it's not a matter of your bloodline your physical descent, no matter your faith in God. If you believe in God, you are a true Israelite. The peoples have, have become the people of God. And then he says, verse 13, those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies, nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Again, this is, this is not the Israel that Zephaniah's hearers would have recognized. It's not the Israel that we see today in the Middle East. It's, it's, it's not a nation. It's not an ethnic group. It's the people of God who, who are the fulfillment of Ezekiel 36. When the Lord said they shall have a new heart and a new spirit, God's spirit should be put within them, and he will make them careful to walk in his statutes and keep his rules. All those who are left in Israel have a new heart that hates the sin that they once loved and loves the God they once hated. They're, they're regenerate. They're born again. They, they no longer do injustice. They no longer do what's wrong. They no longer sin. They don't lie because they've fallen in love with the righteous one, the just one, the true one. They graze and lie down, and none make them, none shall make them afraid. There's nothing left for them to fear, because the Lord is with them. We'll see this some more just a few verses verse 14 
They're commanded, sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. They're, they're called to praise joyfully, exuberantly. There's nothing left to fear. There's only joy. And, and we often, I often do such a horrible, horrible job of this. Where I It's easy to just blame it on Scottish stoicism when they're just not emotional people. And I'm German too, and they're not emotional either. Irish, and they get angry, but still not, not lots of joy that much. Um, we're, we're commanded to sing and shout and rejoice and, and exult. And and there's, do you remember in the Old Testament when, when the ark is being returned to Jerusalem and, and that they're sacrificing hundreds of oxen and David is, is dancing before the Lord and, and his wife, Michal despises him for it because he's not acting as dignified as a king should behave. He's, he's dancing, he's disgracing himself. And, and David responds, I'll, I'll become even more undignified than this. He's, he's just so overjoyed that the ark is, is returning, that God is, is showing his triumph over, over the peoples. And, and there's an appropriateness to that. We We should rejoice. We should exult with all of our heart for what the Lord has done for us. We, we shouldn't, we shouldn't hold it in. We shouldn't constrain it. We need to let that joy show. We need to sing aloud, shout, and rejoice. And in, in the Bible study this morning. For those of you who are there, we talked briefly about the Princeton theologians of Archibald Alexander, Charles Hodge, and Archibald Alexander Hodge, and and they were they were brilliant, <coughs> brilliant theologians, but they were also all so very dry and cold and emotionless. In, in everything that they wrote and everything that they said, it, it was it was all precise and it was all correct, but there was, there was never any joy expressed in their teachings. And I, it's I don't think it's because they, they didn't know the joy of the Lord, but it's because they were raised <coughs> in a in a culture and society and mindset where you know, men aren't supposed to be expressive this way. But that's not what the Bible tells us to do. We should rejoice. We should live in such a way that everyone can see our joy in the Lord. And if people think less of us for that, then so be it. We're obeying the Lord. We should have this joy. We have this joy because of everything that the Lord has done for us. Verse 15, the Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has cleared away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall never again fear evil. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. And, and you know what those judgments are. It's a judgment of guilty for your sins. It's a judgment of hell-deserving Sinner, rebel against the king of creation. Rebel against your rightful, righteous Lord. You are hopelessly guilty. You don't have any chance of bargaining down 
there, you, you have no chance of getting off early for good behavior. You, you have no defense to make at all. You are guilty. And the Lord has taken away your judgment. And, and, and not merely by saying, oh, it's no big deal, forget about it. Not say, eh, I'll just, I forgive you, don't worry. He forgave you your judgment. He's taken it away from you by setting it upon the Son of God. Colossians 2 tells us that the record of death that stood against you with its legal demand was set aside, being nailed to the cross. It's nailed to Jesus. Jesus paid the penalty for your sins. He fulfilled the judgment against you. If you're united with Christ through repentance and faith, there's no judgment remaining for you. None at all. Jesus paid it all. It's been taken away. No condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Not only is the judgment taken away, he has cleared away our enemies. He, he has cleared away all of our enemies. Sin is defeated. Death is defeated. The, the devil is conquered. The, the beast, the antichrist, those who follow them all are conquered and judged and condemned, cast down into the lake of fire. The conquest has, has begun its completion. Certain, the Lord is in our midst. The Lord dwells in our hearts. We should never again fear evil. God has conquered. It's clear to where it is. We have nothing to fear. So often we, we, we are afraid. We should not be. We should fear the Lord and nothing else. Verse 16. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Fear not, O Zion, let not your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. There's nothing to fear. Because the Lord is in our midst. He's a mighty one who will save. He's a mighty one who has saved. He saved us not, not only from this world, not only from the devil, not only from sin. He saved us from himself. He said, we, we are under the righteous wrath of God. He's saved us. He made us his own. But he does more than save us. We, we can imagine, we can picture somebody saving us and still not liking us very much. Saves us from wrath and then just says, you know, now stand over there and stay out of trouble. Don't do it again. That's not what God does. He rejoices over us. He rejoices over you with gladness. And Isaiah 62, 5 has, has the same imagery. Isaiah writes, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. Do, do you remember the joy of your wedding day? If you're not married yet, can you imagine the joy of your wedding day? That the marriage between Christ and His church is, is the greatest, happiest, most joyful marriage in all of creation, and God rejoices over His bride. He, he, doesn't just put up with you. He, he doesn't grumble about saving you. He doesn't wonder if it was worth it. God rejoices over you with a perfect, pure, and precious love. That this is the God who created the world and everything in it. The God who has existed in and of himself in perfect relationship forever. God who has all things and lacks nothing. The God who does whatever he pleases rejoices that you are his. He rejoices over you. The God who knows the full extent of who you are. Every sin, every secret, every scandal, every flaw. 
He knows you completely, and he still rejoices to call you his. He rejoices over you with gladness. He quiets you by his love. We, we just we're, we're blessed in this congregation with a few beautiful young infants. They're, they're, they're beautiful, they're precious, and they both cry on occasion. Uh, sometimes they cry because they're hungry, sometimes because they're dirty. Um, a, a lot of times, though, they just cry because they want somebody to hold them, particularly mom, sometimes dad. They don't usually want to be held by me. I give them credit. The because they're not my daughters. What, what they want is to be held. They want to feel safe. They want to feel loved. They want to know that you are there. That you love them. That you care for them. And, and that quiets their crying. And that's how God quiet all of our tears, all of our cries. <coughs> he, will, he will surround us with His love. He will embrace us with His love. He will satisfy our, our anxieties, our fears, just by the awareness that He is there and that He loves us. And then He will exalt over you with loud singing. Again, this, this is very similar to rejoicing over you with, with gladness, but, but even, even more so. He exalts, he celebrates over you with loud singing. God, God isn't just sitting on his throne impassively, you know, marking off, okay, you're here, <coughs> you're here. You're here. Leave me alone. Don't bother me. I've got a universe to run. He exalts over you. The God that we sing to, the God that we sing about, sings over us. He delights in us. He exalts in us. Verse 18. I will gather those of you who mourn the festival, so that you will no longer suffer reproach. That the, the mourners are people who have lost greatly, who have suffered deeply, those who feel who feel miserable, who feel hopeless, who feel the agonies of their soul. They're, they're gathered for the festival. They're brought to the party. It's it's the wedding feast of the Lamb. That they are brought to, their mourning is turned into rejoicing. Their weeping is turned to laughter. Their sobs are turned to songs. They no longer suffer reproach because they're, they're, no longer, they're no longer mourning. They're rejoicing in the presence of God. They are guests, more than guests. They are children of the King. Honored residents of God's household. Verse 19, Behold, at that time I will deal with all your oppressors. And again, we've spoken about this. We are oppressed by, by sin. We're oppressed by the world. We're oppressed by the devil. We're oppressed by death. And they have all been dealt with. They have no power over you. No guilt in life. No fear in death. This is the power of Christ. In us. All of our oppressors have been dealt with, been defeated, done away with, and, and, and we, if we fear them, what we're fearing is shadows and memories. They cannot hurt you. It's no more than a nightmare, a bad dream. Then he says, I will save the lame and gather the outcast, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. The lame are those unable to move and work on their 
own. We, we can think in, in the Gospels of, of the lame man whose friends carry him on a bed up into the roof of the house and kind of hold him, lower him down in front of Jesus because the man couldn't get there on his own. They couldn't get through the crowd with him. Or, or the man at the pool of Bethesda who's been there for years and he's lame. He, he can't get down into the healing waters. So Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? And the man says, Lord, I, I, I don't have anybody to carry me into the water. I can't get there. The lame cannot come on their own. They need someone to come and carry them. We have not come to Christ on our own, but he has come to us and he has carried us to heaven with him and he's healed us and given us our ability to run to him and to walk alongside him. He has done it. He has saved us. He gathers the, the outcasts. An outcast were the, the unaccepted, the unacceptable. In, in Israel, some outcasts were just members of other ethnic groups. Um, many of them were explicitly forbidden from entering the temple forever just because they're from the wrong people group. Um, the, the most obvious outcast would be those suffering from leprosy who are forced out of the community. They, they have to live on their own elsewhere, and, and maybe somebody would be nice and bring them food and, and leave it somewhere for them to pick up, but they're never going to come back in contact with Jewish people. In fact, they're, they're required to, to go around crying out if, if they're going anywhere. They have to cry out, unclean, unclean, so that nobody gets too close to them and risk catching up or see themselves. They're, they're outcasts. They're outsiders. They're not allowed in. And we should identify with these people as well. We're, we were all spiritual outcasts, unfit for heaven, unacceptable in God's sight, unable to dwell in his presence until God himself gathers us in and changes our shame into praise and renown in all the earth. God has taken the outcast and made him a son. And our shame becomes praise and renown. Here are the sinners redeemed by the Lamb. This is God's chosen race, God's royal priesthood, rescued from the flames of hell, rescued from the chains of sin. Rescued to become the children of God. We should boast in our weakness. We should boast in our shame because God has saved us. We should, we should boast and rejoice and glory in the fact that we are great sinners and God is a greater Savior. He has saved us. We, we should we should never seek to hide the, the reality of our sins. We should never try to make ourselves seem better than we are. We should certainly never try to make ourselves seem better than we were. We need to acknowledge our sins, to show the greatness of God's acts in saving for us. Then Zephaniah closes his, his prophecy. At that time, I will bring you in. At that time, when I gather you together, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. So again, we, we have this this picture of a gathering being brought in and you know, Israel The, the ethnic group of Israel has, has been scattered for nearly 2,000 years, you know, to, to the point more than 2,000 years, really, to, to a greater or lesser extent through all that time, before James can start his letter to the 12 tribes in the dispersion from the diaspora. Um, and God's <coughs> true spiritual 
people, the, the church is, is even more scattered than, than that. We're scattered across the entire world. But we're all united in God. And when Christ returns, he will gather his saints together from the four corners of the globe. And they'll all be brought together. And we will be renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth. Um, Colossians 3 tells us that our life is hidden in Christ and God, not when Christ who is our glory appears and we also will be glorified with him. As we exalt God, God exalts us so that we might better exalt our God. We receive praise and glory and renown. Again, not because of anything about us, but because of what God has done for us. When God restores our fortunes before our eyes. In, in this world, we so often seem like the, the lowest of everyone. We, we are universally throughout history, with, with very few exceptions, to be a Christian as God as defined Christianity is, is to be ridiculed and despised and rejected by mankind. It's there there might be a certain extent of social religion that, that's been beneficial to people, but a true faith in Christ will just get you labeled a fanatic and a zealot and a fool and reactionary. But when Christ returns, when he establishes his kingdom in the earth, and we will be vindicated for our faith. We will receive glory from the Father as we give glory to the Father. And in all the world, will see and know that they were wrong. And that we, we weren't, we aren't fools. We're not superstitious. God is God is great. He's greater than, than everything this world has to offer. And whatever the world offers that we pass up for his sake uh, will be more than repaid now and in the age to come. Our fortunes won't, won't just be restored. They will be multiplied and magnified. Romans 8 tells us we're co-heirs with Christ. We are heirs of the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Creator of the universe. So whatever the world says, whatever your co-workers say, whatever your family says, don't, don't fear them. Don't believe their lies. Rejoice in the Lord. For he rejoices over you. Let's pray. Glorious God, it is the ambition of our lives to worship you. Lord, it is our crown and glory to adore you. It is our pleasure to approach you. Lord, give us power by your spirit to help us worship you. Lord, let us forget the world and be brought into fullness of life, to be refreshed, comforted, and blessed 
Lord, give us knowledge of your goodness so we might not be overwhelmed by your greatness. Give us, Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God, that we might not be terrified, but be drawn near with love, with holy boldness. For he is our mediator, brother, interpreter, branch, lamb, prophet, priest, and king. Him we glorify, and in him we are set on high. We, we have no crowns of our own to give, but what you have given us, we return to you, content to know that everything is ours when it is yours, and the more fully ours when we have given it to you. Lord, let us live lives wholly devoted to you, free from distraction, free from anxious care, free from hindrances to the pursuit of the narrow path of righteousness. We are pardoned by the blood of Jesus. Give us a new sense of it. Continue to pardon us by it. Lord, help us to come every day to the fountain and every day be washed again. We may worship you always in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name, amen.